Thank you. Thank you. Hello everybody, it's, it's a really great pleasure to be here because this is such an interesting problem, such an interesting new way of, of such an interesting way of phrasing things and focusing on an area that people haven't done much before or haven't sort of explicitly looked at before after Mark Stevens talk in Prague, it was a few years ago, in the evening. And it's just waiting to be picked. So I think Pick has a wonderful talent for picking a good problem and actually making it and shaping it and making it actually, uh, phrasing it in such a way that a lot of people would become interested in the problem. So I thought, that, let me see, is, is this the right thing? Yeah. Okay. So everybody, when I wanted a picture, I thought of this one, and I discovered, you know, everybody is always doing the dinosaur. Why? Because the rat has a long tail, all kinds of other things, long tails. So I thought, actually, it's more like there's a Christmas present, the Santa Claus bag with yeah. lots and lots of stuff in there. And the question is, what's in there? So the more I started thinking what to tell today, the more I thought, almost everything. And so I ended up with a talk that was probably two and a half hours. <laughs> so I cut back, and I cut back, and I cut back, and now the talk is probably an hour. But I'll cut back some more. So in the middle, I just skip over, because this morning after the talks of the in invited speakers, some, so a certain theme came through that I really think is important. So I made a slide for each of them that summarizes what I think they said, or at least one lesson you could take from them. And then I'd like to present that too, and that would be an interesting discussion point, and maybe thoughts for this afternoon. Okay, so I'll skip over a lot. If you want the slides, you can just have them. I'll send you the slides. There's a lot of stuff hidden. So if you open it all, there's about 90 or 100 slides. So you can look at this, and there's more that work. Okay. So I want to start with an example that illustrates some of the things that sort of is underlying the reason for this, this whole approach, which came from a question answering system we built in 2000, around about 2000, called Webclopedia, obviously, Webclopedia. So we get questions like, these are real questions that we got, and the system answered, where do lobsters like to live? On the table. Why? Because the lobster's on the table. And it's not wrong. The lobster's on the table, right? So what is wrong? Why is it funny? Because it's partly true. Why is it wrong? Because the live permits an on or an in a location, but not in this way. Or maybe the like. It's also right. <laughs> <laughs> it's true, true. Thank you, Frank. I trust Frank to find the right thing. Yeah. So, so somehow in the composition of those liking and living and on, there's something wrong. But it's close enough that we find it funny from, from the resolution from our, our tension to the, to the human. Here's another one. Where are zebras most likely? Of course they're in the dictionary. Every dictionary in English has that word there, but that's not what we mean. Now, how do you know that? Right? Because I didn't say it's not supposed to, you can't find them in the dictionary. So there's something about the phrasing, something about the composition of the question that is outside of the normal little semantics of these individual <coughs> words. Here's another one. Here, how many people lived in Chile? The sentence came from the, something like, well, uh, some car accident and the nine people from Chile. Da, 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 da. Okay, so there's nine Chile. Okay, that's going to be it. There's no sense of scale. There's no sense of appropriate numerical size. No sense. Yet we know this from the beginning, how numbers work and how numbers plug to the world. That's part of our semantics. If you don't have that, there are many questions in the long tail you cannot answer. You just cannot answer. So when you start thinking about this, there's lots of little pieces, individual different pieces that are going to be in this long tail that we have to be able to focus on. Here's my favorite. This was during the presidential election pre-run and Dukakis. Do you know why the answer came out? Can you guess? Because he has no spine. He's oh. So he's just an invertebrate. Isn't that beautiful? It got the sense. It got a sense. It got a sort of a metaphor. It did everything right, except it got it wrong. But this is a really good example of close semantics. Right? So now the problem, when you do long tail semantics, you're going to get a lot of examples that are funny like this, that are close semantics. And kids do. But kids most often get this right. Why? What do they do in their semantics that we're missing? So there's all kinds of stuff here. This NLP systems give us the illusion that they understand. But to do more, and they use all these resources, but to do more than surface level tra transformations, they need to understand really. And the long tail is a lot of phenomena, different phenomena, I believe, that you need if you want to understand. And the problem is these are small, they don't happen all the time. That's why they're in the long <coughs> tail, not in the big tail, in the big head there. Right, so what NLP can do, 
what language processing can do well today. And here's a little list of things, and the green little boxes tell you more or less when those asymptotes were reached. And you can kill yourself, and now with the neural revolution, the deep uh, processing revolution, these numbers go up by maybe 5% or something. But you reach an asymptote that with <coughs> mathematics you cannot do better in none of these things. Information retrieval, for instance, has been stuck at about 50% recall and precision F-score for a long time, more than a decade. They won't tell you, the speech guys won't tell you, but that's the truth. You go look at track and other places. So if it's all about semantics, what aspects of semantics? Which parts of semantics should we go study? How many such aspects of them? How do we get this knowledge? That's the question, I think, if we want to talk about this, if we really want to study this. What are we going to study? So let's go look at a famous example of a real working QA system, the IBM Watson system. And they built this thing, and they, as you know, they won the, the game. And in fact, they were lucky to win the game. They won. I can show you the graphs, the statistics. They should have lost against Ken Jennings. They would have won against everybody else. But Ken Jennings is a special person. They were lucky that he chose the wrong box, so the double score went somewhere else. If you watch him, you can see when he chose and the double jeopardy did not come on his final choice, his face goes, oh shit, I lost this thing. You can see it. And you can see the IBM guys go, oh. <laughs> the system knew there's only about eight boxes on this board where the right double jeopardy is always set the hidden ones. The system picked the other one. It got it right. It won. And they never played the game again. They stopped trying them because now they won. What did they do for their question types, their answer types, their long tail little semantics? They went and did an analysis of the existing questions that had been planned in thousands of games before. And they found here <coughs> over 20,000 questions, 2,500 distinct types, answer types, a location, a rhyme, a person, a famous act, whatever, things like this. 2,500 types, no? And they used then to try to get, you can see the distribution here. There's city, man, film, state, etc., etc. To get this thing working, they tried, they put, Dave Ferrucci put everybody in an office about this size with long tables and he had all these programs and they worked together and they just had this amazing architecture where they just <coughs> built something, a little module to do rhyming or a little module to do latitude, longitude or a little model to do city size and then they go out and have lunch and it comes back and it's run against the regressions against all the tests and says yes you do better or worse against our test data. They did this over and over and over and over again. And they had eventually all these different specialists for these little linguistic answer types. And each specialist had his own little type system, his own little semantics, his own little world context model, and his own little mode of reasoning. And they had about 104 large specialists like this. And within them, each one had sort of subspecialties. And they said, that's what we do. Now, it's not an elegant theory. This was not a great piece of intellectual advance, but it was a fantastic piece of engineering. If you look at Weston, Jason Weston, the guy Colbert and Weston, they built a thing called Senna about five, six years ago from Montreal. as an embedding, neural embedding type representation. They recently wrote a paper, <coughs> it's a very interesting paper, where they said, according to them, these are the principal types of reasoning that an AI reasoner, language understander slash reasoner system should be able to do. So I can't see if you know there's single supporting fact, three facts, three argument relations, counting, simple negation, indefinite knowledge, lists, yes or no <coughs> questions, two argument relations, two facts, basic co-reference, compound co-reference, deduction, position reasoning, path finding, agents, motivations, goals, and these, etc. They give little examples like this. According to them, in their analysis of questions and things like this, they built their system on and tested on all kinds of different applications. These are the major clusters of specialty, of kinds of special micro theories, if you want, that would fit into something, which they don't happen in all questions, but they happen somewhere, they fit somewhere in the long tail. So I like to build representations that look like this. Let's say we have a sentence, Jerry Hobbs bought the green Toyota, so there's a buying, which we have to define in our ontology, or our lexicon with its case frames. It takes an agent and a patient and a price and a time. And it tells us that person is, a, <coughs> assume Jerry Hobbs is a person, and a car is a Toyota and green. We don't know the price, but because it's a car, it's probably somewhere in that range, and so on. And then we have another sentence. He and the seller were both happy. And as a human, you look at this, you say, so? 
But as a system, you say, well, he is the same as Jerry Hobbs. How do we know this? We need some kind of co-reference. There is this thing called a seller. Where is the seller? Why the seller? Who's the? What is the previous antecedent for the? It's hidden inside this binding, even though it's not in my formal representation yet. But it should be, right? There's this cause there, somehow we assume. That's where the happiness came from, right? Because they both achieved some kind of goal. That's all meta stuff, the meta theory of buying that you need to know if you want to be able to answer things about this. And this little meta theory is not a large phenomenon, it's a small phenomenon, right? So you get all these kinds of questions there, this value range, and questions like this, you can imagine sitting there, coming into your text, hidden in the text, explicitly in the text, a dependency that needs to be resolved so that later in the text things can be done properly. And these are all just around the action of buying. Now, you have 100,000, 120,000 words. Let's say you have 10, 15,000 major verbs. Not counting senses, just verbs. Right? Your senses, maybe you triple that or double to triple that on average. Are you going to build a little theory like this for each of those words? If not, how are you going to solve the long tail problem? What are you going to do? This is a problem, right? So I started thinking about this and I thought, you know, there's a lot of things I asked you, what Johannes this morning also. What would you say are the major, major micro theories that you need to address if you want to look inside the long tail? And I think there are things like little theories about location and about time and about co-reference, and about numerical information, counting and ranges of numbers and typical ranges, roles, who does what, and so forth. Background factual knowledge, just knowledge about the facts of the world. The Second World War was a war, and it happened in Europe, things like this. And then background conceptual knowledge, some kind of taxonomic knowledge, organization of your background concepts, and things like this. And then something about inheritance. And then, for each specific little problem that comes to you, you have to build what I think of as a micro-context, a little sub-world that just holds for this little particular sentence or text. Just like Pick showed us this morning, we're playing chess. Ha! Ah, here's the little chess micro-world. And now we're talking about the daughter Anna going to school. Great. Here's the Anna micro-world. And now we go drink beer and the bar is not far away and here's the little beer micro-world. We have in his little example three micro-worlds. He didn't do this example by accident. He made this example precisely because it has three micro-worlds each one coherent in itself, but quite different from one another, yet for us fully believable in a social context of two friends being together. We need to know these micro-worlds, and we need to know the micro-theories that underbuild them so that we can put this all together, and then we'll be able to do something like the long tail. That's what I think. And so here, inside there, there's these kinds of things how you could test this is finding normal and anomalous events, and each of these is a set of projects or papers that I have, and I'll show them on the next slide. This is multiple inheritance and perspective and things like this. So, and there's a lot of this, this kind of specific general knowledge that you have to build that you cannot, no single person can investigate all this. That's why we need a big effort. That's why I welcome this. I think it's a fantastic thing to start now. This, this long tail, calling it long tail is brilliant. It's really nice. So if you look at discrete representations moving to continuous representations, we're right in the middle of the embedding revolution where we don't have to have little symbols alone and we don't know how word senses that sort of move from one to the other. A bridge is a different a bridge on the violin and a bridge on the nose and a bridge the card game, but a bridge across the river, whether it's a rope bridge or a suspension bridge or different kinds of bridges, these are kind of close together. There's a semantic continuum and our representations are too crude. But the embeddings, the vectors, these things are much easier to slip around its line. So this is, this is not a problem anymore, I think. And there's a bunch of papers that, that some students and I published over the last few years to explore that aspect of semantics, representation. You need these latent relations I mentioned this morning, and there are two papers that begin to find out relations between nouns and nouns and verbs, how you can find them without actually listing them and running into the case row problem that's too discrete. You need to understand these micro theories for numbers and locations and dates and times, and, and uh, there's a lot of work that has been done in linguistics on that sort of work. You have to understand the dynamic collections of background facts and concepts. I'd like to talk a little bit about that. How you can build world knowledge in your system enough that you can actually, for any particular purpose, pull out a little micro world there. Here's some papers along those lines there. 
And then you must understand compositionality. I take this thing, I take this thing, I take this thing, I put them together, and now suddenly I have a composition that is a coherent micro work in its little micro context here. That compositionality has a lot of complexity. In. If I say he's buying a car, your expectation is the price is somewhere in the thousands. If he's buying shoes, your expectation is the price is somewhere in the tens. How did you know that? Is that in shoes or is that in buying? If you believe that's easy to do, I tell you about the brown cow. And suddenly you know a brown cow is no longer a Holstein, the black and white cows that you see out here in Holland so much. But it's a brown cow, it's a Jersey cow or a Hertfordshire cow or something. Is that information about the breed inside brownness or inside cowness? Are you going to learn for every bigram of words, every adjective noun combination, every noun noun combination, every noun verb combination, the possible things that have to change when you compose them? Where on earth are you going to see this? How does this work? <coughs> Nobody knows that today. It's a really interesting problem. A lot of people have tried this, or the Oxford School rules people. Nobody in the, in the distribution semantics idea has a clue how to make this work. Manfred Pinkel, everybody makes these crazy things. Nothing works. Very interesting problem. Long term phenomenon. Okay, so there's a few little papers about compositionality and uh, anomaly detection and so on. So I finished the overview now, the introduction. So now I'd like to describe how you can build some factual knowledge, an A box, an assertion box. How you can get some background knowledge together. Just a little example of what we did as a little project. Then I would have liked to describe the conceptual knowledge, how you can go to the web and harvest and make yourself a little hierarchy. And actually, not a simple hierarchy, a simple taxonomy, like, like something like most of the taxonomies we get are, because the world is not organized that way. And I can show you so nicely. I probably don't have time, so I probably will skip over. I'll just show you two slides. I'll skip over probably 30. Okay? And then some high-level concepts and abstractions, just one or two slides on even higher-level things, and then the conclusions and results, and some thoughts on what we have this morning. And please, please, <laughs> I would love to talk for two hours, because there's a lot of things that are not in this little list here that we just don't have time for. But there's lots of stuff interesting to the long tail problem that one can bring here. And it's a question when one designs something like you're busy designing now, what phenomena you want to focus on first and how that will unlock things later. We come back to that point at the end. So let's look at factual knowledge. Is it okay? You're with me? You understand? Yeah. Yeah, my language is not too quick or too <laughs> soft. Is it okay? Yes. yes. If I'm a slow down, tell me. Okay. The DARPA <coughs> program follows on something called the DARPA machine reading program for the last 10 years almost, where DARPA has funded a bunch of groups to take text, not a million texts, a few texts, and try to read them deeply and then answer questions about them and do some inference on them. And so we have, uh, part of this is something called knowledge-based completion. It is a challenge where they give you a bunch of texts and they give you an empty database and they say, find the entities in there, link them all together against something like Freebase with 80 million entities. So if you see Obama and the president and something across different texts, link them all into the same place. Tell me what you see about this, make a line for each entry in each text and then link them all together and say, okay, this is what we know, know about this person and this place and this organization and this facility. And, so and then do the same for events. So essentially, extract out of the text as much as you can and formalize it into like a big knowledge base information extraction task. The major task, people have worked on this. What we discovered is language is full of holes. Language doesn't say probably 40% of what you need to know, what you need if you're a system, to understand. Because you don't, you have background knowledge that the hearer knows you, the speaker knows you have, and he skips it. When I say Obama, I don't say the President of the United States, because you know. When I say the White House, I don't say what that is and how that relates to Obama, because you know. Right? The system doesn't know this, so we need to put that in. Where do we get that in? Well, in machine reading, they took a stupid example, football, American football, and they worked on that for like four years. So we had to deal with football, which I'm not crazy about, but you can see the texts are very difficult to understand. And it's a metaphor for war, of course. And so they could sell in DARPA to the people they talk to. They could say, wow, football. Okay, so good. Okay. So here's some typical language. William Floyd rushed for three touchdowns, and Steve Young scored two more, moving the San Francisco 49ers one victory from the Super Bowl with a 44 to 15 football route of Chicago. 
And so you sort of look at this, and if you're not American, you sort of, oh, you sort of figure it out because you know a lot of things about how games work. Yes? Especially this last sentence. San Francisco's Eric Davis intercepted a Steve Walsh pass in the next series to set up a seven-yard young touchdown pass to Brett Jones. Does anybody here understand what that means? Do you have any clue what the hell they're saying there? This is normal American English. I couldn't understand the first time I didn't know what, what that meant. What is a Steve Walsh pass? What is to set up? What is a seven-yard young touchdown pass? How, does this, how do these guys relate to one another? Who's on which side? <coughs> do you know that? Can you figure that out from that sentence? I couldn't. And none of my students who are not Americans could either. So when you look at this, there's a whole bunch of questions that I don't have time to read them all. But the, let's look at the bottom ones. To resolve this, we built a knowledge base. How can we build a background knowledge base about football? We parsed lots and lots and lots of football stories. We broke them down into syntactic triples, a little triple story. And we broke them up into these syntactic roles here. And then we broke them and we put them into something we call the prop store. This is just a very, very big triple store that's organized according to about 200,000 words of English, about 40 syntactic relations, which we get from the parser, and about 200,000 same words, plus a bunch of part of speech tags, plus word and super sense tags. So I give you the word dog, and I read all the sentences I can about dog, and I say, Dog appears as the subject of barking 49 times and as the object of being walked 254 times and as a modifier to Brown, Brown and modifying it 399 times, etc. Okay, that's what I do. This now functions as my de facto background knowledge store. It's very crude, but it's very easy to build. And we built this thing over, we built it twice. It has about 4 billion triples in there from reading all the stuff we could. Eventually, more recently, we built a new one, and we built out of Wikipedia and the three languages, English, Spanish, and Chinese. So we've got these three boxes full of knowledge coming from triples that we can now query. And we can query single little triples. We can query combinations of triples, more and more elaborate combinations, until eventually we make such a complex thing that it's never seen that before, and it answers zero. No? The, struck, the thing that struck me is that these boxes, the fullest box English is only 2% full. And even it built, it took about three months to build the English box. If you, with big machines running all the time, if you want to add more, you can add more all the time. It stays 2% full. This combination of these little 200,000 by 200,000 by 40 relations is so large compared to the text that we read that it's very, very hard. Many of these combinations just never occur. So either they're in the long, long, long tail, or they're just semantically incoherent, which is good news. If we can find and fill this kind of box into a knowledge store, and we can just make this available or use it, then already we have some stuff that maybe when a long tail question, a little world comes along and says, suddenly I'm in railway world, or I'm in food world, or milking world, or cow's world, suddenly maybe we can pull out all the subparts of the box that relates to the right words and have this little piece of the box that gives us expectations that otherwise we wouldn't have. And where did it come from? Just the text the system has read. It's the texts. It's the system's world knowledge. It's experiential base. Since it doesn't live in a world, that's the best we can do. So we use this thing to answer little questions like this. What are these things? Young touchdown pass and touchdown pass to Brent Jones in the following way. Here are then little questions, little triple type questions, to this thing. So if you want to know a pass and a touchdown, what's the relationship between pass and touchdown? You can ask this thing in the noun, noun preposition, noun kind of thing. You look for the prepositions that link between pass and touchdown on these little planes in the box. And it'll say, oh, you can have the preposition for 700 times or include 24 times. If you say, what do quarterbacks do with passes, what, what verbs are there between a quarterback and a pass, it'll say, sometimes they throw them 98 times, and sometimes they complete them 27 times, and so forth. You can ask, who is a thing called Marino, and it'll find there, okay, anybody named Marino, there's little sub, subways we had to take the parts to and give the names proper relationships in there, and you see sometimes, a quarterback was called Marino, or a passer was called Marino, or a leader was called Marino, or a veteran, etc. How can you use this? Let's take a little sentence from the last paragraph. That sentence, 
to set up a seven yard young touchdown pass to Brent Jones. And we pass that thing, we get this pass tree. There's a young touchdown Jones pass, and we have a noun noun combination, a noun noun combination, and a preposition to. That's what the parser gives us. That's uninterpretable to, to us, to me. So now we go to our little triples, and we say, well, what is a young pass? And we find, oh, young is actually a quarterback, according to this thing. And what do quarterbacks do with passes? They throw them or they complete them, according to this thing. Just the world knowledge is counter. What is a Jones? Jones is an end. Apparently an end is a position in this game. And what, is an, what does ends do to pass? They catch them or they drop them. That's interesting. You say, let's just take the most popular, most frequent one, and let's put it in there. Young is either throwing or completing this pass. Jones is either catching or dropping this pass. This touchdown pass, we still don't know what it is. It's just a noun phrase. Noun so let's look at touchdown pass. Is there a verb between them? No, there's no score for verb between them, so it's not a verbish kind of relation. Is there a preposition between them? Yes, four. Okay, let's fill this in. Now we have a longer fragment. Name does something to a pass for a touchdown. What is that something, that verb that we can put inside there? And we'll say, oh, complete or catch. All right, let's put them in there. So we can say Young completed a pass for a touchdown, and Jones catches the pass for the touchdown, and we put them in the right places. And now you've taken this red sentence, and you've rewritten it by adding knowledge from your background knowledge store, which you just got through parsing a lot of football texts in a very simple way into these two sentences. And if you now look at them, it's much easier to understand what's going on. Young happens to be a guy who took a ball, he's a quarterback, and he threw the ball, and then this other guy, Jones, caught the ball and ran, and when you run across a line, that's called a touchdown. You're not touching anything, you're not doing down in American football, that's called a touchdown, you get a point. Okay, so these two sentences together said, one guy took a ball and threw it, the other guy caught the ball and ran, got his point, and that gave the first guy the sense of completing. He was, so that's somehow the verb they use for this. That was the explanation of what this red phrase means, which I didn't know what it meant. So you can take, the message here is, you can take a very simple thing, a proposition store, which you get out of a parcel by passing the other stuff, and if you know how to decompose your, te your text in, a, in an adequate way by asking simple questions of this, you can bring in additional knowledge and enrich the text and rewrite it into ways that are richer, that are easier to understand, that are closer to the traditional simple kinds of semantic sentences that we use when we run semantic parsers and stuff. So if you do this, you get, if you look, this is the original one, and then all the blue stuff, all the, the non, that's the blue stuff, and all the non-blue stuff is the stuff that enrichment would give. So we ran a whole bunch of extra experiments about how you can get enrichment and rate enrichments and all kinds of things on various other domains. And we built up a whole bunch of papers around this, this idea of taking something like a prop store and enriching with background knowledge. So how does this fit in? Well, I think if you want to attack the long tail, you have to attack the problem of knowledge sparsity, of knowledge scarcity, and you need some kind of background knowledge. And this is the simplest and easiest thing I can think of. People in the semantic web and people all over the place have the large knowledge bases and domain-specific knowledge bases and stuff. Great. Use them if you can. But you need some kind of knowledge if you want to do something in the semantic on the long tail. Now, our systems don't remember when they have read something, that they have read something, and they don't enrich themselves so that tomorrow they read better. And that's a problem for our system. So we need to take the texts, have the system process them, and remember the results so that tomorrow, when they read and do things, they can actually put that information to use the next time they read. If your system doesn't do that, it's a pretty stupid system. If your child doesn't do that, you take him to the psychiatrist. <laughs> so there's something about what we need to do here to make our systems a little better. Okay. So the, syst the, the, the summary of this little piece is decomposing into millimole units allows easy confidence scoring, and easy storing and updating, and things like this. This sets up something you could think of as a knowledge frontier. If you think what happens in your head when a new fact comes in and you don't really know what it is, you go to Google and you read about it. And if you don't do that, you sit and you ask your friend about it. And you still don't know enough, and you say, you know, this thing puzzles me. I need to know about this. 
and maybe you go home tonight and you ask somebody about it. Or you sit and it's alive in your mind so that next time anything comes, you skip, 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 and oh, oh, and you look at this thing and you think about it. And your knowledge frontier grows a little bit, grows a little bit. What the knowledge frontier does and what our systems lack is it demarcates the place between known and hypothetical and completely unknown, and it gives the, sense, the system a sense of a goal, a hunger to learn more. Today, our systems, unless they're built like this, have no natural drive to learn more, no natural, to, no natural drive to read more. If you had a system that had a knowledge frontier and it started reading simple things, it would learn the head first. And as it found little more tail phenomena, it just say, I don't know what this is. I need to find out about this. And since it cannot read everything all at the same time, it could just store this in the to-do list, its knowledge frontier, until it could then maybe go and ask Google or ask Wikipedia or something tonight when you've gone home and have supper, it's busy reading and teaching itself. And any time it doesn't know anything, it puts that on the knowledge frontier. Every time it does know something, it fills that into its knowledge base, into its structure. I think this sort of self-organizing, self-trained, self-guiding system is crucial if we want to attack the problem of the knowledge paucity of our systems today. And this is a way of running. Okay, that's the end of this little first part. I skipped over all the technical details of the thing. I just wanted to give you an int intuition. Is that okay? Yes. You can ask, I can send you papers and things. Now comes the part I have to skip over altogether. How much time, this thing says 34 minutes. Do I have time for just like five minutes or less? Yeah, yeah, yeah? Okay. okay. Here's the problem. A lot of people have tried to learn ontologies automatically and they've all failed. We don't have automatically learned ontologies. But if we want to learn long tail stuff, we need to organize our concepts somehow. Why did they learn? Why did they fail? What we want to do, let's say, is simple. Can we learn basic terms, the blue ones, the sort of bottom leaf ones, and can we learn the superstructure above them just by reading the web? So you think, well, here I give animals, I run some patterns on the web, and I see there's rabbits and lions and dolphins. And then I see there's all these blue things there. And then I learn there's some kind of organization between them. And then I learn there's more kinds of organization between them. And then I learn there's all kinds of subrelations between them and so forth. And eventually I said, good. Marty Hurst, about almost 20 years ago, built this little, these, what they call Hurst patterns now. NP such as NP1, NP2. And you say animals such as lions and tigers. And when you try those things, you discover they're very noisy. A lot of people have tried, a lot of people have a lot of noise on them. There's some names, right? Even for other relations, not just type is a. A colleague and I um, worked a little bit to build something we call the double anchored patterns, which is a much cleaner way, much easier way to do this, where you add an and in there. So NP such as NP1 and. You just give one example, and all such as lions and. And suddenly, that little magic line disambiguates a whole lot of stuff and gets rid of all kinds of noise. So you just put lines in, you learn a bunch of stuff in the star position, you take each of them, you replace lines by those things, and you just keep growing, growing, growing until you, you sort of bottom up. And this helps then if you have languages such as Java or C++, and you say languages such as X and Spanish, suddenly, uh-oh, C++ and Java just die. That's never on the web. But languages such as English and Spanish, or Spanish and Spanish even, they are on the web. I say, great, okay, so this helps to disambiguate. So you can then learn little things like this. There's still some problems. You can have a project that pro provides for the introduction of animals, such as peacocks and the, and the master plan, and then you learn master plan there, because of the way the sentence structure works, it's not perfect. But over the large scale of things, you learn much more quickly good bottom level things. Now you can turn this around. You can make this first one, the empty piece. So something such as lions and tigers. Because you've learned a lot of these bottom ones. What are the things that go up from them? And you run the sort of recursive animal again, and uh, algorithm again, and you learn all kinds of things. So here's a little exam ex example. We ran animals such as lions, people such as Madonna. And we ran and we learned about 1.1 gigabytes of animal slippers and 1.5 gigabytes of people. This was about five, six years ago. And we discovered a very interesting thing, which these taxonomies never give you. There's many, many, many more middle things than bottom things. Many more middle things than bottom things. And they keep growing, the middle <coughs> things that little graph shows you. 
So for animals, you have accessories, activities, agents, amphibians, animal groups, animal life, amphibians, apes, arachnids, area, felines, fish, fishes, etc., etc. And if you look at them here, you found that there's many more diverse, and there's some sort of useful there. And when you measure them, you discover the basic level concepts, this and the intermediate level concept, always or above the basic level concepts. So we learned all this stuff, and we said, oh, shit. Now we got this problem. We got the bottom things, which we thought are the main things. We got the middle things, which is much more, how do we organize this all? And skipping a whole long story, the question is, how do we put those little red curvy arrows in the middle to make it work? And so we built two little algorithms, which we called concept positioning and concept children text tests. And one of them is just, I go to the web and I say, animals such as lions and something, tigers. Or I say, lions such as animals and tigers. And I ask the web, which is the more popular sentence? And guess what? This one is more popular. This means that animals is above lions and tigers. This one is incoherent, so the web doesn't like it. So that's the little concept positioning test. This one is just looking at how many children each word has, and you can sort of intersect them and so on. When you do this, you learn some interesting numbers about how many you get, how WordNet is about 50% missing things, and the precision you get from, from the algorithm against WordNet and from humans is interesting, sometimes higher, sometimes lower, but WordNet still is missing a lot of information, so WordNet isn't a good thing to go test against. So you can build little hierarchies like this, and there's still a lot of problems there, but there's too many different, because there's too many kinds of categories. So just to finish the story, it struck me when looking at this, that what we're doing is we, as humans, actually create different kinds of intermediate groupings and the words that we have in the, in the middle group are grouped by sort of functional characteristics. So when you look at an animal, a real animal, not a non-real animal like a griffin or, a, or a, a dragon, or an evaluative term like he's a snake or he's a something, a real animal is either the basic animal or a genetic class of animal, or the behaviors like how they socialize. Are they group animals or singular animals? The habitat, are they field animals or are they jungle animals? The feeding, are they carnivores or herbivores? The morphological type, are they exoskeleton or endoskeleton? The role of functional, are they pets? Are they zoo animals? Are they farm animals, etc.? These kinds of organizations, which you don't get from the web, are crucial to organize all this mess. When you do it this way, suddenly things become a lot cleaner and every thing finds its place. At the bottom, you still have cow. But cow has multiple inheritance. He's a farm animal, and he's an endoskeleton, and he's a mammal, and he's a whatever, all the different things. And the same for lion, etc. Right? So we did a little annotation exercise where I wrote definitions for each of these things, and we did through all, and we ran this annotation, and we got all kinds of scores from different four, pe four different people, and you can see the kappa scores going down, and we simplified them down, and we get eventually reasonable, though not great, kappa scores in agreement to try to make this. And so eventually, doing all this, you can get reasonable hierarchies for animals and for certain kinds of things like vehicles and so on. When you try to do it for emotions, you are lost. You are dead in the water. <laughs> emotions don't taxonomize this way. So not the whole world doesn't yeah. work this way. It's just a disaster. That's the end of this little piece. There's, of course, a lot more I had to skip. But let's go to the next piece. It's short and then we can finish. Higher level concepts. Getting just your basic little words and your facts and putting them in the box, the prop store, and then getting the concepts that govern them and putting them into some kind of multiple index taxonomy is the beginnings of getting background knowledge. But there's more structures that you use all the time when you think. And one of them is things like goals and plans and other types of knowledge, scripts and so forth. Many kinds of aspects of semantics require this knowledge to make sense. And here's one example, unfortunately, that I'll I can only give one example from when I was a graduate student that really illustrates, I think, the point nicely. My advisor <coughs> had just started a company. He bought a big BMW 700, and he liked to go from New Haven to New York to go gamble on the horses. He was a big gambler. And he never drove slowly. He would always go 100 miles an hour or more. And so one day he said, oh, damn it, the police copped it, caught him again and so forth. So now he bought a radar detector, and he installed this radar detector in the car to warn him when the police were looking. And one of the students said, oh, it's like the canary in the coal mine. And he said, who? Huh? Because he wasn't a very educated person. He was just a very clever person, but he was a jerk to him. Not an academic. And so they explained to him, look, 
In the old days, when people went into the coal mines, the carbon monoxide gas is poisonous to people. And if they're dead, they, you don't smell it, you don't notice it, suddenly you're just sleepy and puff, and then you're dead. No? So they take a little canary, and because it's so small and it's breathing and so forth, it is much more quickly affected. So they hang this canary up there, and when the canary is falling down, they know we need to get out of here, there's carbon monoxide, and they get out. That's the same as the radar detector. Now I ask you, why is it the same as the radar detector? Why did that student have that reminding? What's the metaphor? You've never heard this example before, I think. This is in your long term. But the bridge, the explanation, is a very complicated relationship between a dangerous situation for an agent who takes a warning device that can sense the danger before the agent can and can signal to the agent what to do to get out of the dangerous situation. Yes, that is a plan and a goal and all kinds of configurations of things that is not said in any of these words. The word goal and plan was never said in anything I told you. And yet, those are the key indexing structures that allow you to bridge this one and this one and say, they are the same. Anyone who tells you they are the same, you'd say, yeah, you understand. Anyone who says they're not the same, you say, well, what do you mean? They say, well, it's canaries and this, you say, that's not the point. What is the point? It's the structural articulation, the structural similarity that's the point. Our systems cannot understand unless they can do this. To parse into goals and plans and configurations is not a simple thing. People have tried for 35 years since Charnier's thesis, still cannot do it. But if we want to understand the long tail, we need to do this. Okay, so I'm almost finished here. Let's look at now this morning's little talks, these invited talks. I would like to say that it seems to me that first, it may be a good idea to focus on entities <coughs> or to separate out, as Martin was doing, entities and events. Entities, because they're names for specific things, and the specific things are sort of constant in the world, a table and a glass and a computer and a microphone, and they have their existence where an event is often a change of state, it's a short little thing. There are many, 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 many more events than entities. So we don't tend to give them names. This workshop has a name, and World War II has a name, and Brexit has a name, but most events don't have names. The fact that you sit down, and the fact that you stand up and whatever. They just don't have names. The way you name them is you give the little entities that, can, that, that make that thing together, the you, the sitting in this room, etc., on this chair, those things together define this little name. So because there are many more events and they occur much more fleetingly, just once and then gone, they are in the long tail much more than the entities are. There may be some entities in the long tail, ones that just don't occur very much, but when they're there, they're usually named, there may be a minor sense with their name. It makes entities much more easy to address, first on, than events, which were much harder to go and play with, and that's why events reasonably process it as well for entities, implementation and linguistics. So if you now say, look, if we have a text come to us about some little event, and we know this little event is a unique little event. It's going to be somewhere on the long tail down there. We may never see it. But maybe we're lucky and we have this little set of entities. And these entities, when their configuration, maybe they define this event. Maybe we, don't, we still don't find the event. But maybe we find events like this event that involve the same kinds of entities. Let's call that then a little micro context. So when we see a friend, somebody and a friend playing chess, talking about the white queen, we don't know that specific entity. We've been talking about that. That's not in our prop store or in our store already. However, the fact that two people play chess and talk about a white queen, that's maybe something we will have read about. So let's define that little thing as a micro context. We pull out just this knowledge about queens and chess and sitting down together and chess boards and so forth. And we bring that and we make that warm. We call this little world a micro context with whatever micro theories we need around it. Theories of games and fighting and all this kind of thing. And then this micro context we define to be a small packet of information specifically relevant to this, which then captures the words that are relevant, because in this we can go and find out from the web order or from the prop store what are the kinds of actions that go with this word and this word, capture, queen, chess, game, play, chess, what other verbs and so forth, just like I showed you before in the football example, make a little list and say, these are the senses of these words that we expect now to find in this micro-context, right? 
So we can find the words, the correct senses, their denotations to the specific kinds of entities in the world, there through whatever denotation model you have, some kind of co-reference information you can have, typical event roles you might have there, default fillers, this kind of thing you use by pulling out from the pop store whatever you can find. No? Now, we can't create them in advance because we don't know what little configuration of entities is going to come to us in the story. When Peek starts his story about two guys playing chess, we don't know he's going to end up going to, to drink a beer. Maybe if we know Peek, maybe it's like, but we don't know it necessarily that's the case. So we have to be able to compute this in going up and making and using these microcontexts dynamically. Right? So we can prepare micro theories of time and location and we create a large fact base, like a proposition store or something more elaborate or something on the semantic web. This we can store in the background. This is our knowledge. And then when a given story comes, we just pull out whatever we can, we parse into whatever we can, and we find whatever scripts and plans and little information <coughs> packets we get. We ask the pop store and we populate this thing as much as we can get. And maybe we use that to go and query the web more. Or maybe we use it to re-rank or however, in order to make the long term manage it. So Martin's talk today essentially talked about this. He said, keep the natural distribution, which means don't mess around with the distributions of things in your basic system. What he said is, take this micro context and use it to re-rank what comes out of the system. So do your query retrieval and then say, now it's giving me everything. And now I use the fact that I have a micro-context that is boosting certain things and pushing other expectations down and use that to re-rank and by God, when he did it, that's what he got. I checked with him. This was a correct interpretation of his term. This is a nice example from Obama. Last month, President Obama visited Japan to Nagasaki and things. It turns out that very close, there's, another, there's a city in Japan called Obama. Same spelling. Now, Obama has its own little context of Japanese city and stuff, and Obama has his context of being the president. Can you imagine how a system where it's screwed up when it's Obama and Obama together with the two contexts mixed? That's what happened with the systems and that even people got confused, right? So there's a beautiful example of two things of the same name come and crash in these worlds and one has to deal with that. Fortunately, it doesn't happen so often. Antal talked about the long tail is where the tokens become types. He said down here you have a token and he's like his own individual little guy. And he's the same as a type or a token. The instance is the class because that's all you get about it. Okay? Sometimes there are, that's not always the case, but usually. So you can get these micro context words, and when they're in your thing, you say, Great, thank you, thank you for giving me this unique little word. I'm going to put this in because he's going to help me pull in all kinds of related words, anything that's in his distributional context. And then Amtal said a very important thing cluster words and stuff. So when a new token comes, Look at his behavior vis-a-vis -vis his other words in the sentence and look at other words that have the same sort of families of behavior and cluster them using K nearest neighbors or something and say, here's the word I know with all the relation, related distribution words he has. Here's this new word I don't know. And he's sort of similar here and because he has the same sort of related distribution words. And let's see how I can make a mapping. Is he to the left of me, or above me, or down from me? That's why I asked Anton, what are the different the semantics of the different dimensions of analogical transformation? That, I think, is a fascinating way to try to build, to map from one space to another, to build your micro-context. I don't have time to go through this idea, but you see what I mean. Then came Johan, and he said the long tail is very long. Yes, that means there's lots of stuff in there. There's lots of things we have to do and be prepared for. He showed that as the text gets more, the tail keeps growing, although it grows slower than the main part there. So fortunately, it gets less and less, but it's still very large. Right? So we have to map from known to unknown. And what, what Johan showed is, even though the word unhappiness is not there, un and happy and miss are. And so if you can do the untold trick by putting happy in its full context and seeing how you move from happy to the word you don't know, or from happy to words you do know, and then un and miss, and you can do the morphemic transformations, you can actually do a transformation of unhappiness into some other word that you do know composed this way, and maybe you can actually get information and carry it over. Create your micro context with the appropriate information. I don't know how to, this has to be worked out, obviously, but that's one way of doing the transformation, different from what Anto was saying. So there may be multiple ways of doing this transformation. 
Jan also said, don't worry about scope and quantification, do worry about these other things. Those are all parts of what you have to do if you want to do this, this long term. And now, Ivan's talk, representations defined by linguists are not appropriate for a reason. He said that was very interesting. So, do frame induction. That is to say, go find a frame that governs a certain situation and go learn it and learn its parts. What is that other than micro-context building? If you can do this dynamically, you come to a situation in the text you've got, you see this, you say, oh, no, I need to learn a new frame. You go, you run Ivan's thing, you learn a new frame on the web, you come back, now you have a little micro-context. It helps you. So if he's, his, his system works as well as he said it does, which I don't quite believe, but it's nice <laughs> to see, then it would be great to use. No? And finally, Stefan's talk, and he went completely from a new perspective, as he said, and he said, let's look at what's happening in the semantic web. Here we have these little semantic models. You could think of each little triple as being context-free, context-less, context so you can't really interpret it, what it says. But in the little context, in its little collection, in its little database, you say, oh, this triple goes with these other triples, and therefore the Earth is flat or something. It's not just a fact. It's the Earth is flat in this statement of this historical book. So the, little con the, the context of that little set gives meaning to the little triples in them. So if you look at the, the, the sets and how they relate to one another, which is what he did, you can see which sets are the most important ones, which give you the most links to anything else, and you can start using them to inherit contexts down and try to build your local context, your micro-context, when you need it. Again, details have to be worked out. So the long tail, is my conclusion, is long but rich. Many, many, many kinds of representation and many, many different kinds of reasoning are sitting in there. And if we take if we don't get panicky about this, but try to take a systematic approach and say, no, we're going to take this, and then we're going to take this, and then we're going to take this. We know that these phenomena are coming, but they're not being tested yet. In set 7a, they will be tested, or set 12b or something. If we have a roadmap, a plan, then we can actually have a way of describing this whole enterprise over multiple years in a way that makes people feel, okay, you want to work on this phenomenon? Why don't you make this initial test set for us? And then we'll bring it in, and so then you can distribute the work to people who actually want to do it. That's another thing we could try, right? So there is a joyful richness to keep us all happy for a long time. This is why the long tail idea is so good. It's saying, don't, don't focus, focus on scope and quantification and junk that have been studied forever. Focus on the things that are new and needed to be done and rich. So really, I think, we need this kind of picture if we want to go animal picture. <laughs> There's beauty in that. <laughs> Let's enjoy it. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Um, it's a long story with a lot of details in there, so there must be questions from people. Uh, uh, so somewhere in the middle of the talk, he said that you were uh, learning examples of, of concepts from text, right? Uh, and that you learned uh, the taxonomy of that. But that, there is a, a long tail phenomenon there as well, I think, that you learn the most typical examples first because you encounter them most. So do you think, what's the effect of that? And also, how, how far do you go? How, uh, well, when, when do you know that you have all the examples? Or I assume that you don't, but what is the approach? I had to skip over so much, but there's a beautiful case we had that exactly speaks to this, where the little pattern we applied started polluting itself because it pulled in texts that were wrong. So people would say something like, we, one of them was cities. So cities like this and this and this, or countries. Countries like Ukraine and Georgia. And now you put countries like Georgia and, you would say, oh, and Florida, because Georgia is a state. Yeah. And the system didn't know, and there's uh, countries like Florida and New York and Massachusetts. And suddenly the thing pollutes through a little hole like this, and we get into trouble. So I don't know. We didn't know what to do with that. So, but that's a, that is a problem, that you can leak and pollute yourself. So you have to exercise, you need some kind of criteria of control that would say, when I'm learning, I must be very careful, distribution checking that every new thing I learned, when I fit it into the context, it actually matches well. And if it's a long tail, small phenomenon thing, I may run into trouble. Therefore, I think this knowledge fringe, that's exactly what's on the knowledge fringe. I've got this thing, I'm not sure about it. I've tried a little bit, he doesn't look like completely rejectable, but I don't trust him yet. That goes in my context fridge, my knowledge fridge. That's exactly where the knowledge fridge is in. Thank you. 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 Thank you
That's why we need. As a human, you do this all the time. When you don't know something, you wait. And if somebody talks, you say, I have a question. And then you debug it right there. So our systems have to learn to talk, to actually ask. Because they want to know, not because we make them ask. Because they need to know in order to do their work. Go on. So, very nice. I was surprised that you thought that events, there are more events than entities in the long term. On the token level, I would agree, but we should really look at types. Right? We want to abstract. I don't think there are more event types than entity types. That's a good question. I, I don't know what tokens would, I mean, it's very hard to talk about. Of course, there are more events than entities. Than entities you know, I think there are yeah. in the world more yeah. events than entities but because event depending on the granularity, yeah, 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 let's yeah, say. Really, so now on the token, on the type on, level, on the yeah. type type, yeah, okay. There's far fewer verbs than nouns in all language, but these the the verbs that you use they map into lots of little configurations that that the nouns. I don't know. Maybe I was just talking junk. Maybe I shouldn't talk at lexical level. I should just talk at, at semantic level. In the long tail of semantics, I do believe there's more events than entities. In the lexical level from nouns and verbs, yeah, there's more nouns than verbs. And so that means the ambiguity factor from verbs is just much larger, or the, the instance factor. Because the, the, the combinations and the combination power of entities today. Yes, thank you. Thank you for fixing Okay. So, uh, I was interested, so you chose the word micro-theories, uh, so we know that term, mm -hmm. so psych is made up out of mm -hmm. micro-theories. Yes. So was that a coincidence or... No. I, that would was you... a deliberate choice, okay. uh, because I, I don't okay. like psych, but yeah. I do like that. Okay, well actually I do like psych. <laughs> and, okay, good. Uh, <laughs> good <point. laughs> um, because I think a lot of the things that you were asking, for example a theory about plans yeah. and motivations, you know, there's rich micro-theories about that. Uh, I think your uh, canary in the coal mine example, I would, no, uh, I would think that even current site would get quite a long way. On, I think that's true. On that, given its maximum. Okay, so that yeah. was one question. So yes, there is deliberate suggestion that stuff like psych could be could function as micro theory. So my problem with psych is methodological. If you, if I gave you twenty years of how many, much money, thirty million, forty million yeah. dollars, to build a company like so I can build it, you would not sit and say, "Oh, well, I'll hire fifteen guys and you do freeways and you do this and tomorrow." You would say, "No, no, no, no. Let's do a systematic thing through a dictionary." That a, Doug Leonard never did it. He's a big bullshitter. He doesn't know how to organize his science, and that's my problem with science. Okay, so yeah. sure. So we can discuss. So fortunately, I was in Europe, so we never ate, away, ate into my funding. Yeah. But uh, <laughs> uh, but so when I said I like psych, I mean I like the end result, all right? So uh, this new, this knowledge base one no, now it's there through whatever crappy, wasteful process they had. Yeah. Now it's there. We may as well explore. Yes. The other question I had on micro theories, you graciously kind of equated. Antal's neighborhood clusters with micro theories, which kind of surprised me because that is on the extreme other end of semantic in, uh, uh, informativeness. This was the word gracious is well chosen there. I, I think it was. I, I think that is a way of, of beginning to inf to to interest people who, who understand and do clustering that there's more to clustering than just simple finding word overlaps and words you know word set overlaps and doing something in a, in, in a metric space that there's implications to that metric space, that you have to choose the dimensions right. carefully and there's a semantics to them that is beyond their little uh, view that they have. So many of my students, when they discover clustering, ah, oh, wah, 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 you have to tell them there's no such thing as clean clustering. You go talk to what's his name from LDA, right? There's no such thing as clean LDA. All this stuff is noisy and messy. Mm -hmm. And when you understand it and approach it humbly, with the idea of moving to semantics, then you have the right approach. If you just think this is the answer and you do topic models and stuff like this, then you just waste everyone's time. A little bit like Doug Dublin. So I have the same sort of easy feeling about there's a good idea, but it's it's oversold and it's not understood in the proper context. That's what I mean. And so clustering is sort of the beginning point, as you say, toward this richer, definitely. But that, I think the interesting thing there is that moving from there towards the more more, more uh, strict semantic representations, you're crossing a particular border. Because one is from probability, and the other one is from impossibility, possibility. Yes. Even though you can say that, okay, if you conceive the world different, there are different possibilities, impossibilities, 
that doesn't mean we don't work with that. And this is what the six-year-old is doing. It's, it's building this coherent picture because it knows what are the possibilities and impossibilities in his naive world. We are all naive in that sense. But we use this, and I think that's the difference with psych is built with strict properties. Uh, and pulse clustering is the extreme of the most rich, uh, unstrict uh, 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 semantic groupings. Somewhere in between, we move over a particular border. We don't know what, the, uh, what is that border. And so this is also your hunger, maybe, for knowledge. It's, it's my, it, I watch my two-year-olds, if I can. Yeah. So I watch <laughs> them play with a little toy, yeah. right? They have a little goofy on the dining table, and yeah. I know this is not a real thing. Right. And I bring this goofy, and I put this, and I say, you don't want to eat the grapes? Goofy is eating the grapes, <laughs> and then she eats the grapes. Yeah. So she knows Goofy can't eat the grapes, yeah, and but. yet she will make Goofy eat the grapes and then take it herself and so yeah. She knows, so at uh -huh. lower than two already, yeah. they know this line. Yeah. What that is, I don't know. Yeah, and that, I think that's, that's fascinating. That, that, that is one of the things we should really try yeah. to yeah. discover. Yeah. Any uh, are there other questions? Antal. Yeah, maybe on, the, on semantics, the, the, the breadth of your talk is uh, really nice, and as is the whole day. I mean, we cover AI, NLP, everything <laughs> in the world. Um, uh, so, so it's almost like the Chinese guide's uh, answer yeah. that we're approaching today. Um, but uh, so, so just to zoom in again on the semantics, so, so uh, uh, you, you laughed a bit about the, the impossibility of dealing with brown cow, and, and that, that evokes all kinds of uh, Pretty precise, precise uh, nuances, but but actually, if you if you do translation uh, and you look at the phrase table, which I often do, just uh, uh, well, also out of a linguistic curiosity, what is in there, you see these these engrams because in both uh, languages that you're trying to uh, to couple, uh, they are meaningful, they are meaning bearing units, and, and not not the components, but but uh, the whole the units, the units. So but the brown cow as a unit is different from knowing it's a whole, it's not a whole time, but it's a jersey. Mm -hmm. So you can replace, as a human, brown cow by Jersey. Mm -hmm. But to have the system know I'm allowed to say not Holstein. There's a cow and it's not a Holstein, where it's just that there's a brown cow. That, that bit of nuance there, I don't know where that comes from. Uh, well, yeah, and that's something that's that what translation I, you wouldn't you would care about right. necessarily. Uh, right. uh, but, but I do think that, that uh, you don't want to be too strict about uh, this, this compositionality. Uh, and trying to decompose as, as far as you can because in fact if you, if you let the machine do that then it doesn't go as far as far and in, in, in English you have spaces everywhere in Dutch you have some, somewhat less fewer spaces in this word and, and the machine goes, goes a, lot, a lot further than that even mm -hmm. it groups words and, and phrases and have, have sentences Mm. And in Chinese even more. Exactly. Yeah. So yeah. go to uh, go to Chinese. That's right. right. So the sort of chopping granularity. It shows that our way of writing is too granular maybe compared to our way of thinking. No. And yet we somehow know there are these islands of semantic zones where, where it's okay to say and then things go just impossibly far. Mm -hmm. so, so how we know that, it has to be something like frequency. I don't know how else we would impose the, the topology on top of the space of semantics. It's not flat, right? It has little things of likely or unlikely or must. And that has to that has to come from just experience in the world and reading our know, systems. That's all they can do. Yeah. But the, the thing to my feeling is, so you're moving then to if you if you are more liberal, you move from tens of thousands of words to millions of phrases. Yes. Millions is not is not crazy. No. We can store. Yeah. Yeah. Like that. yeah. We do. Yeah. yeah. It's not yeah. hard to show that. Yeah. Uh, so so uh, uh, and and allowing uh, millions of. of it may, may allow actually for, for, for some more sparsity later in the system because you, uh, you, you can pack a lot in, uh, into these, these large uh, chunks of uh, you know, speech. So I'm just, I'm just thinking about what does what parts of speech mean? Uh, and what is the word? What is the meaning there? Really? I've wondered a lot about this. It, I think it's no accident that when we go to the web, to Google, we type two or three words. Yeah, exactly. We almost never type one word no. and we almost never type four words. Mm -hmm. Because three is, for our level of complexity in 2010 or 16, three is enough disambiguation power to get you down to more yeah, or less what you want. Whereas if we'd done this 10,000 years ago, maybe two would have been enough. <laughs> maybe even one. And maybe if you speak Bush of the language or something, maybe yeah. one isn't. What's your question? Okay, last question. And then... uh, what is the relation between what you've told us and uh, the never-ending learning system, the NEL? 
Now I must be politically careful. Oh. So, <laughs> no, no, it's a great idea. Correct. Tom is a wonderful researcher, a very clever man, and a brilliant salesman, a little bit like Doug Levitt. But Tom doesn't. Tom is a machine learning guy. Doesn't understand anything about, much about natural language. And so the people who work on NEL apply these sorts of patterns. Well, the, they know about double anchor pattern. They don't use them. They build these things. And what they get is a taxonomy, which is mostly nouns, sometimes noun groupings. They have just tried as somebody now doing the thesis committee. A lot of them come to me for the thesis committee. And they just basically run into trouble. Their taxonomization is just a mess. And it doesn't really work. So the idea of never-ending language learning is great. But learning a little ta taxonomy of terms is a long way from learning language. And it's Tom's wonderful salesmanship to sell it as language learning, where it's actually just taxonomy collection, it's a taxonomy term collection organization. And that's the, one has to keep these things very clear. So I respect Tom and I like him, but I don't think that's the best project we could have made in that money. Same as Psych, who will write a criticize. Okay. Well, thank you very much. Uh